scientific event of this day. Uh, it is one of the very nice aspects of being president of ISIR that, uh, you, that, I, that you can select a special lecture, a so-called presidential uh, address, and uh, I uh, had immediately the idea to uh, select for this special lecture uh, Professor Alastair Stern from the Univers Technical University of Zurich. That's a big difference. In <laughs> Uh, uh, for this uh, lecture. Uh, she is a long-term friend and uh, collaborator. We did uh, <coughs> several things together, some of which you uh, might have heard or probably have heard in the morning, the research on uh, chess uh, that Roland Papa presented. Uh, in fact, we were, uh -huh, this doesn't work as I wanted. Uh, okay, uh, so that Ronald Abner presented. Uh, we also wrote together two, uh, let's say, books for lay persons, uh, for uh, the general audience uh, on intelligence. Uh, this is especially surprising as, as Elspeth is an educational psychologist and she is one of the rare uh, educational psychologists who is interested in the fields of uh, intelligence and who believes in the impact of intelligence that is very rare among uh, educational uh, psychologists. <laughs> uh, yes, <but. laughs> Elspeth started her uh, academic career as a cognitive psychologist with a focus on academic learning in science and mathematics. She received her PhD in 1987 at the University of Hamburg. Uh, and after that, she had several positions at the Max Planck Institute of Psychological Research in Munich. In 1994, she became professor of educational psychology at the University of Leipzig. And 97, she moved to Berlin and uh, to the Max Planck, to the very well-known Max Planck Institute uh, for Human Development in Berlin. Since uh, October 2006, she is professor of research on learning and construction at the renowned Technical University of Zurich. I mentioned that already, where she is also head of the teacher education program and also since 2012 chair of the Department of Humanities, Social and Political Sciences. Uh, she has studying the interaction between intelligence and learning and knowledge uh, in a large age range. Uh, you will hear about that. Uh, she did research on the use of visual spatial uh, tools in learning and is also uh, editing uh, on the editorial board of several journals. Uh, she is also uh, on the board of science. Uh, so uh, she is in, furthermore involved in many international discussions on the relations uh, between neuroscience and learning and how neuroscience can be used to improve learning. Yeah. Elspeth, we are happy. Uh, that doesn't work. I, I don't know what, what, what's going on here. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is a different system. Better <coughs> start with your presentation. I, I don't know how. Uh, this okay. Yeah, this was only to show Roland. Uh, uh, Roland Nabner, who is our, uh, so to speak, child. Uh, the way uh, he took, he was oscillating between different places where Elspeth and I uh, were working. Okay, so uh, my pleasure, special pleasure to uh, have you here. Uh, we are looking for a final for this nice introduction and also for the invitation. It's my big pleasure to talk in this audience about education and about the relation between intelligence and schooling. And I hope that uh, yeah, you will be informed that the, the, the gap isn't that big. Given there was really a common uh, past, a common history, 
Nowadays, education, psychology, and intelligence research are a little bit like estranged uh, yeah, siblings, but I hope they will come together soon. So there are their common roots, we all know of them. It, uh, intelligence tests were developed uh, to inform ed educational decisions. For instance, about special education in the uh, United Kingdom, there was Cyril Bird very well known for developing tests which uh, yeah, uh, informed admission to the secondary school, to the so-called grammar schools, and the SATs were informed, uh, which uh, are used in the States by intelligence tests. And we shouldn't forget that the intelligence tests were validated against school achievement in the early days, and there were also very well-known uh, intelligence researchers who started as educational psychologists, as uh, Carol and Kohlbach and many more. So there are also some reasons for growing apart, and one of them is, of course, intelligence tests lost a little bit of their impact on educational decisions. One is because uh, special education nowadays is practiced uh, any longer in most countries in special schools, but it's a kind of inclusion. So there, are no, there is no longer a need for intelligence tests. And also in the uh, United Kingdom, the tripartite system was replaced by a comprehensive school system, therefore the intelligence te tests are no longer necessary. There, is, oh, there are uh, school systems which use streaming or tracking, particularly in the German-speaking countries, in Austria, in Switzerland, and Germany, but there is no tradition of basing the decisions on intelligence tests or other uh, standardized tests, it are, is more the feature decision. But uh, this produces interesting results, which I will uh, present at the end of my talk. So uh, there are other reasons for both fields to grow apart. And one, of course, is that both fields uh, develop a little bit different research foci. Uh, to say it in a certain sense, um, education psychology focuses more on the increase of means while intelligence research is interested in the variance. And this, of course, led to different research uh, questions and agendas. In education psychology, one wanted to find out what kind of teacher practice, what kind of school systems might improve uh, the achievement. And also, there was a cognitive perspective on learning, uh, which uh, focuses more on how knowledge can be enhanced and uh, also other uh, factors than intelligence, uh, so-called cognitive factors, motivation, they are investigated uh, according to, uh, to their impact on school achievement. Of course, you know better than me all the research agendas in intelligence research, which focused on the impact of genes and of the interaction between genes and environment, and also on the neural correlates of intelligence. <coughs> So both fields uh, made good progress in the last years, and there are pro probably good reasons to focus on different uh, yeah, topics. But uh, I think the time came to come together again. But there were also some serious attempts uh, to undermine the collaboration between both fields, and they came from quite prestigious universities, from Harvard and from Stanford. To start with one, uh, Carol Dweck, she has done good research on uh, yeah, motivation, but uh, her, yeah, how she uh, considers intelligence really deviates from what uh, we probably understand by intelligence. For her, it's not so much what intelligence is, but how people see intelligent. intelligence. Uh, it's, and it could be better to see it as manageable and not as fixed. And if you read the citation, uh, no, sorry, uh, if you read uh, this, uh, for her, genes are the same as uh, these chronological and uh, chronological uh, things. So, of course, I think nobody would agree to this. There are also other attempts uh, that cognitive intelligence, uh, co cognitive factors aren't that important for school learning. There was the idea of emotional intelligence, which of course uh, there are emotional competences, but uh, we know that uh, these competences cannot be measured to the same degree as intelligent cognitive intelligence can be measured. <coughs> and uh, Howard Gardner was, uh, had very big com uh, impact on schools and on teachers uh, with this multiple intelligence, uh, which, as I said, talked down the importance of uh, cognition. We know it's not true, but it's very popular. 
There were also other attempts which were not very fruitful for a collaboration between schools and uh, yeah, the intelligence uh, researchers. And this was, for instance, uh, yeah, this book, Bell Curve, which uh, yeah, conveyed the message that investments in education are, uh, yeah, they are called into question because yeah, genes uh, were understood more as, uh, or genetic was understood as unusual. <coughs> And when there are some misunderstandings that similar IQs uh, means similar genes, we know of course that's not true because there are many people who didn't have the opportunity to develop their genes and to develop the IQ. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, that was also mixed with ethnic uh, questions. There is no reason to assume that the genes that uh, yeah, express uh, the color of, uh, of the uh, skin and of the hair are the same, which are, are responsible for intelligence. So there is no reason to mix this up, but it damaged a little bit the collaboration and also the reputation of uh, the field. Anyhow, we know it better today. I very much like this book. It's no longer nature versus nurture, but nature via nurture. It's an, uh, a very nicely written book from Matt Gridley. And the question which comes along here is, what kind of nurture do genes uh, related to intelligence need to express themselves? So it's really that you need to every gene or most of the genes need a certain kind of nature in order to express. And when, we, when it comes to intelligence, we should ask what uh, yeah, kind of nurture, what kind of environment is needed for genes to express. And one of my favorite sentences, I already wrote it in the abstract, is psychology now recognizes intelligence as education's most important product as well as its most important raw material. It comes also from a person who was involved in methodology, very much Rich Snow. Rich Snow. He passed away a little bit too early, but I also like the sentence, the psychology of human differences is fundamental to education. And uh, I would like to focus on two things, the product and the raw material. So first, intelligence as education's product. Uh, yeah, what does it mean? It means, of course, that higher cognitive competences, as they are measured in intelligence tests, uh, and particularly also in non-verbal ones, they require schooling for uh, the genetic potential to display. Without schooling, no intelligence in the way we can measure it in tests. The second is, of course, IQ uh, stabilizes in the course of elementary school. There are very uh, many, many data on this. And this happens at an earlier age for the verbal IQ than for the non-verbal IQ, which somehow or it clearly predicts, uh, it clearly contradicts the investment theory of intelligence, but it shows the impact of schooling on intelligence because in the beginning of school there is a lot of verbal activity and this uh, helps to stabilize uh, individual differences in their cognitive potential. And there are also many, many studies which show that the quantitative and qualitative uh, aspects of school education, education can boost uh, the IQ <coughs> at least by some points. For instance, the summer hole or the years of school CCS shown them. So I think uh, this was covered by the literature. And uh, the next point is education as, uh, or intelligence as education's uh, yeah, raw material. There are correlations between IQ and school achievement. They vary between 0 and 0.77. Uh, I write 0.77. I looked up the correlation in Ian Deary's paper, which was discussed yesterday morning, and I found the correlation of it was uh, the reported correlations of 0.77 for mathematics and IQ. Uh, so it's really very high. Uh, yeah, correlation, but I will also report data which show that there are zero correlations. And what we know is that the correlations are higher for achievement tests and for grades, uh, which is clear because grades are given by teachers and they are biased by many yeah, assumptions. And uh, if they are higher for mathematics than for other subjects, however, there is something more to this story. What happens when prior domain-specific knowledge comes into play? What happens to intelligence? And how does instruction alter educational outcome? And now I come to the second person, 
who was quite similar to Dick Snow. Uh, he was a European person, Franz Weinert, unfortunately also passed away too early. He was director of the Max Planck Institute for Psychological Research in Munich. He was my academic teacher. I worked with him uh, for many years. And I also would like to present a longitudinal study, after we saw so many longitudinal studies. Uh, he uh, yeah, developed the study in Munich. And there were a lot of well-known people also involved in it. Uh, some know Gerd Asendorf, Andreas Helmke, Wolfgang Schneider. And the idea of this longitudinal study was really to have a comprehensive view on human development. The number of uh, yeah, subjects is relatively low, as you see in a, a moment. Uh, we started with 220 children. They were born in 1980. And uh, they, but it was a very dense, uh, very dense measurement point. Three times a year, the children came to the institute. And we had a lot of measures uh, on intelligence every year. And uh, when the children entered schools, we tried to get the whole classes for some of the tests, so we can combine educational impact and individual development. There were follow-up tests even after Weiner's death, uh, when kids uh, were or the young people were 25 years old uh, and 70 years. Um, I could, of course, uh, tell a lot of, about the story, but I will focus on one field, which on Gerta told it already, is my, um, my uh, yeah, competence and this is the development of mathematical and scientific knowledge. We tested verbal and non-verbal IQ, mathematics, achievement, reading, memory and social indicators, all kinds of shyness for instance. And uh, the research question was uh, the main challenge and the main specific income on education outcome and also on other variables. And the question was, of course, how do individuals with different cognitive abilities exploit learning opportunities provided by schools? <coughs> so I'd uh, first put to, uh, yeah, I'd tell something about intelligence and STEM learning. Uh, the question is, of course, what happens when prior to main specific uh, knowledge uh, comes into play, and how does instruction alter educational outcome? And we have to uh, have become aware of the fact that there is more about academic achievement than just brain characteristics. So think about a very intelligent uh, yeah, inhabitant of the Roman Empire, Caesar or whoever, he wouldn't be able to solve this problem just uh, not because he is stupid or he was stupid, but because uh, this was not in his culture. The division was not part of the culture. Uh, today's uh, yeah, medium gifted child, uh, age six uh, or eight, could easily solve the same problem in another simple system just because the culture today has provided yeah, uh, tools, symbolic tools, which has, can be used for as reasoning tools and which can be used for developing more abstract concepts. When we want to understand the difficulties of learning science at school, we also should uh, call it uh, to um, our minds, that uh, yeah, the human mind or the human brain, to the best of our, our knowledge, uh, was more or less developed 40,000 years ago. The genes which guide the uh, yeah, brain development, they haven't changed much uh, in the last 40,000 years. But of course, the knowledge has changed a lot. But most of uh, the other topics which are part of the curriculum only changed uh, yeah, some uh, hundred years ago. For instance, the use of script just 5,000 years ago, and the use of uh, Arabic numbers in zero 800 years ago, analytic geometry, which caused a lot of difficulties, was invented 400 years ago, and so on. This is the laws of uh, mechanics uh, 300 years ago. So it's, uh, from this perspective, it's kind of miracle that medium gifted children can learn these things which genius minds have developed over thousands of years. But we have to consider yeah, the cultural development when we talk about uh, yeah, achievement and about academic achievement. So from a cognitive point of view, learning, academic learning, is knowledge construction. And of course, we are all familiar with the different uh, distinct things made in cognitive science. 
declarative and procedural knowledge that means knowing what and what, knowing why and knowing how. And declarative knowledge is composed of facts and concepts. Concepts are very important because uh, for learning in STEM areas and other academic fields. And there are two ways to change concepts, enrichment or restructuring. Remember the example Alyosha brought to yesterday morning that uh, Graz is the second biggest city in Austria. Probably not everybody knew it, so you learned something new, but it was quite <coughs> easy to understand because you didn't have to restructure your concepts about Austria or your concepts about city. It was just adding the new information or probably a little bit of restructuring if you thought that Salzburg was the biggest city. But in many other fields, you have to restructure your concepts in order to understand uh, yeah, the scientific concepts or mathematical <coughs> concepts. And the challenge in STEM learning is what we call radical conceptual restructuring or change. And this often means the shift from just some characteristic features to defining features. A simple example is uh, what is an uncle. A little children say it's an old man, but of course that's a, only a characteristic feature, and the defining feature is it's a parent's brother. But this kind of shifts can cause a lot of difficulties, particularly in physics and mathematics, and I will just bring some examples. Consider just a seven-year-old child. You ask the child, does a heap of rice have weight? And the child says, yes, of course. Then you take a single uh, rice grain, ask the same child, does this grain of rice have weight? No. So the question is, what uh, does this child miss, you will ask. <coughs> General cognitive abilities, Piaget probably would have said, said still not in formal operation, still not in formal operational thinker. But these are outdated interpretations. It's just the conceptual knowledge that's uh, different in children than in adults or older children. Because Susan Carey had the wonderful idea to ask the child, uh, child, what happens if you put the rice grain on an ant's back? Does it have weight? The child says, yes, of course, then it has weight. So the child just has a very different concept of weight. For the child, weight means uh, an object feels heavy. For the most adults who didn't uh, undergo physics uh, studies, I would say what you get from a scale, and the physicist says uh, the force of the object due to gravity. So this is the same word, but very different understanding, and a lot of uh, yeah, instruction in school uh, goes wrong because teachers do not recognize the gap in conceptual understanding. And this causes uh, yeah, the difficulties. I bring another example to show that children have, have perfect logic, but they miss just conceptual understanding. Uh, one of my colleagues told me a very nice example of his little daughter. She came home today. We learned at school that humans descend from apes. Is the true? Baba, yes. And the child, when was I an ape? <laughs> so the child is perfect in logic. Uh, but of course, it has a different concept of mankind. Uh, it understands uni uh, doesn't understand human beings as species. It thinks men are just the people uh, she knows. So she was a baby, so <coughs> why should uh, she be, has been known as an ape? And there are these kinds of difficulties that uh, cause, uh, are these kinds of misunderstandings that cause the difficulties in STEM learning. There is also conceptual restructuring in mathematics. Uh, in, at school, uh, we, have to learn, we had to learn that there are more numbers than counting. Counting is uh, somehow based on innate, innate resources. We know the number instinct. But at school, we have to learn about fractions. And then we learn that, uh, yeah, uh, you see the examples, that uh, 6 7 is larger than 6 8. And uh, the decimal numbers, we have to learn that not every number has a defined successor. And all these things cause difficulties. One example I will focus on is understanding the credit quantity comparison. When I started to work on uh, learning early mathematics, there was one result in the 1990s which uh, was found uh, all over the world, which was really striking. Uh, it was in the time when transfer was an issue. You have the uh, words problem here. Here are five words and here are three bones. 
suppose all the birds uh, race over and each tries to get a bomb, how many birds won't get a bomb? If you present this problem to a six-year-old child who didn't enter school yet, uh, yeah, about 99% uh, will solve it. Uh, but if you present the same problem with the question, how many more birds than bombs are there, you only get uh, 25 of the kids uh, to solve the problem. So what's the discrepancy? Uh, I worked a lot on this discrepancy in the 1990s. It's not just birding. There were a lot of experiments which showed that it had nothing to do with language understanding. It's really understand, and uh, you can find other problems uh, where you even have a larger discrepancy. Um, it's really the understanding of numbers because these equalizing problems or these warm uh, bird problems uh, they uh, draw on a very different number understanding than how many more problems. I will uh, show this in a minute. One can represent number to number five, for instance, as five uh, objects, as you can see. Uh, preschool children easily can do it, but you also can understand it as just a section on the number line, the relational number, and this really requires academic uh, yeah, training. Uh, children do not bring this uh, kind of knowledge, uh, just uh, it doesn't develop spontaneously. It should be focused on, uh, at, at school. And when I was involved in this longitudinal study I described a minute ago, I presented a lot of uh, comparison word problems to find out how they impact later mathematical understanding. And I would like to share with you one result which shows the impact of prior knowledge compares intelligence. It's again this logic study. I only focused here on students um, when the higher, highest track of the German school system, the gymnasium, it's not a gymnasium, it has nothing to do with sports, it's really uh, the highest rank of the schools, and it allows uh, yeah, access to university without any entrance tests. Uh, we had mathematical competencies in grades two, three to six, and algebra was tested when the students were 17 years old, so still at school, at least at gymnasium, and we had intelligence tests all the time, which was <coughs> non-verbal. Uh, I wanted to find out how a student's uh, achievement was in this kind of algebra problems. Um, they were not really appropriate for 11 uh, graders. Uh, they usually one deals with this kind of problems when uh, students are in grade 8 or 9. But I presented them as speed problems, so uh, it was a solid measure of mathematical abilities. In second grade, I had this kind of comparison problems, uh, and uh, here we uh, see a more complicated one, which really uh, yeah, requires a lot of uh, building of mental models. In the fourth grade, I had this kind of problems. Uh, you can read, uh, which also requires uh, children. Most of the children act instead of multiplying, so it also requires kind of abstract mathematical modeling. And what I wanted to find out was how these measures predict algebra learning in grade uh, 11, and I could compare it to intelligence. These were the correlations, so I just had simple uh, correlations. The sample size is too small for all this complicated analysis, but I think the story I want to make uh, correlations are enough. Uh, I also had computing, that means arithmetic tests, and here you have the intelligence tests. And you see four uh, interesting correlations, which show um, here you find achievement in second grade in mathematical reasoning. That means mainly word problem solving, and a correlation of 0.58 with 11th grade achievement uh, in mathematics, uh, while uh, intelligence <coughs> measured at 11th grade. That means at the same time. <coughs> Uh, as the young people took the algebra test, uh, had a correlation of 0.41. Of course, I can't, uh, there's no significant differences, uh, but uh, it's interesting to see that this correlation uh, is at least not lower. <coughs> I did also, uh, here you see the uh, yeah, scatter plot, and what can be seen is that uh, children who performed poorly in grade two on these word problems, they had rarely a chance to catch up uh, in mathematics later on. So early, 
prior knowledge matters, and it matters more than intelligence as soon as you, of course, include prior knowledge. Intelligence has the impact of the acquisition of knowledge, but as soon as you have measures of knowledge, uh, intelligence loses impact. And this can be also seen in this communality analysis. Uh, uh, you have here this kind of uh, diagram. diagram. This is just the impact of second grade mathematics. It's just the explained variance, and uh, most of the variance remains unexplained. But it's interesting that there's only a very small uh, part of the variance explained by intelligence. If, it's, if intelligence hadn't been invested earlier on in mathematics, of course, this is confounded intelligence, which plays an important role. But the story is you have to invest intelligence into knowledge. A learning project, uh, to so the question is <coughs> more or less intelligent students differ in their kind of knowledge acquisition. I've uh, never found uh, evidence for this. I expect there must be some differences, but um, yeah, up to now nobody has ever found it. A more intelligent children make similar but fewer mistakes and less intelligent ones. And more intelligent children need less time for achieving uh, a certain level of achievement just. But uh, it's only time and mistakes and there are no, no qualitative differences. A different trajectories have uh, the, uh, hardly ever been identified. Also, I think it's worthwhile to go on with this. I will come to this later. So uh, the story here was uh, that uh, yeah, intelligence has to be invested in prior knowledge in order to predict um, the achievement. And I know most of the intelligence uh, studies, uh, yeah, they do not consider prior knowledge and therefore they write quite high correlations between intelligence and uh, school achievement. But as soon as prior knowledge would be taken into account, uh, the impact of intelligence goes down. But, uh, so the next question is how instruction may, may alter uh, just mathematical achievement. And I draw on the same data set uh, you saw before. Um, we know that instruction can have a really a very uh, yeah, or good instruction can have an impact on students' achievement. And educational psychology also has found a lot of uh, variables which, uh, yeah, which characterize good instruction. And I will just mention some of them. Uh, and they all go back to teachers. So all political attempts uh, to, change, uh, to change the school <coughs> system to reduce class size, they do not have any effects unless uh, teachers uh, change the way of teaching and unless they really uh, yeah, give give a kind of instruction that is more meaningful to the children and so on. So it's really uh, the teacher who makes the difference. And what uh, makes a good teacher? Is it just a personality trait or whatever? No, there are we know some factors which can be learned, it should be learned in teacher education, it should be learned in professional development. The kind of professional knowledge teachers need we call pedagogical content knowledge that means to combine the content and the knowledge about teaching. That means, for instance, being aware of students' misconceptions in the field, the misconceptions you already learned about. Teachers have to know them in order to be prepared as to present them. And also supporting conceptual change by providing problems that cause productive failure, for instance, really <coughs> yeah, cognitive activation of students not just uh, practicing all the time, uh, yeah, probably of the same kind, but really uh, challenge students' minds to, uh, to help them to build up conceptual knowledge and also providing informative in, uh, feedback. Many, many studies have shown that this is really effective, uh, an effective way of improving students' achievement. And what I want to show is that teachers who are aware uh, of these uh, factors and to have a kind of pedagogical content knowledge that they really uh, yeah, produce better learning outcomes than teachers who haven't. 
Uh, in this study, it was published uh, more than 10 years ago, but uh, it helps to understand uh, how teachers can alter uh, <coughs> games. Again, this was uh, the sample uh, I relied on. And this time, I relied on the sample which uh, came from the schools. So we had a pick up sample of more than 1,000 students. <coughs> What we did was uh, we presented a questionnaire to elementary school teachers which had been developed in the United States a long time ago. We translated it into German. And uh, the questionnaire asked uh, yeah, about the teachers' uh, yeah, understanding of how learning works, whether it's more a direct transmission view. That means the teacher has to uh, yeah, just write something on the blackboard and it directly flows into the students' minds or whether teachers have an idea of knowledge construction of, uh, and they see their role more in supporting students to, uh, to construct their own knowledge. So the constructive, uh, this view would be children learn math best by figuring out for themselves the ways to find answers to simple learning problems. The direct transmission view would be an effective teacher demonstrates the right way to do a word problem. And the teachers had to agree on a scale from one to five uh, to or disagree on these statements. There are altogether 48 items. And we found tremendous results. If you uh, yeah, stay on the classroom level, we found a correlation of 0.50 between the teachers' uh, degree of cognitive constructivist uh, understanding, that we not, di not direct transmission view, but really understanding learning as uh, concept construction and the, uh, yeah, the classroom games. And I should say we are in a very lucky situation. We had a quasi-experimental situation because in Bavaria at this time there was a compulsory teacher change from grade two to three. So we could disentangle the students' prior knowledge and teachers' uh, yeah, impact on students' knowledge. So this was a lucky situation we made use of. Therefore we uh, got it published quite well. But I would like to uh, present some more detailed results. Uh, we, uh, the sample size was large enough to do some complicated analysis. Uh, we had mathematics uh, yeah, achievement in grade two. This was also word problem solving. We had the IQ in grade three. And we had the impact on teachers' beliefs. And what we find, of course, is that uh, individual variables always account for the biggest part of variance. But uh, it was, uh, in this case, it was the prior knowledge. While the impact of IQ, <coughs> if it's just the prior knowledge is included, which of course covers a lot of IQ, I don't call this into question. But what I want to say is that the poor IQ, if it hasn't been transformed into prior knowledge, uh, doesn't account for much uh, variance. We see that uh, <coughs> that uh, yeah, the gamma of this HLM analysis for IQ was 0.16 and for the teacher's beliefs was 0.12, so it's quite similar. So another question that came up is of course, and it always comes up, whether students, according to their abilities, also according to their intelligence, gain from different kinds of instructions. Whether poor achieving students uh, that are overtaxed probably by a cognitive constructivist view or by other more demanding kinds of instruction. And what I should say, it has never been found. Uh, this sounds very plausible that probably there would be an uh, yeah, interaction like this. So the poor achieving uh, yeah, children, they gain from another kind of instruction than the high achievers. But in uh, yeah, many, many studies tried to find this kind of interaction, but it has never been found. So it's a, I think it's a very good result. Yesterday evening, we had a poster from my poster, uh, Esther Ziegler, who also looked for aptitude treatment interactions, but we didn't find any. So uh, we can conclude that just uh, good instruction, professional instruction, helps all students, but of course according to their uh, abilities. And uh, the goal of schooling is not to reduce variance, but to shift, to shift just the normal distribution in the right direction. So <coughs> now I come to another question. Why do correlations 
between intelligence and educational outcome or achievement varies so tremendously. So I have found some which are zero, so most of the, or many of them are point 20, and as I said already, in Ian paper, I found a correlation of point 77 between IQ and uh, achievement. And uh, yeah, this uh, correlation, of course, suggests that there was uh, yeah, not much room for altering achievement by instructional quality. There could be no room. There could be two reasons. Uh, one is, of course, that all teachers in Scotland are alike, or at least very similar, either uh, yeah, similar uh, good or similar poor, uh, we don't know, but they don't produce, uh, produce variants. Or it could also be the case that the measures of these tests, and I look them up in the internet, it is a standardized test on uh, yeah, achievement, uh, that uh, they um, <coughs> allow, or the, the uh, tests uh, presented, or the topics tested, they can be uh, acquired in different ways. In mathematics, I look quite carefully at where uh, tests on proportional reasoning, on fractions, on percentage, <coughs> And the test was presented when children were 16 years old. So uh, if they had a poor or bad instruction at the age of 12 when they learned fractions, the intelligent students could, uh, yeah, could have many other opportunities to learn about fractions because uh, yeah, you can, uh, there are many uh, just opportunities uh, in everyday life or whatever. So it's really probably the case uh, that there are some topics at school which uh, yeah, require or are more dependent on instruction than others are. And we know that yeah, regular mathematics can be learned. Um, of course, it's best to be learned in an area by a good teacher, but yeah, there are many other opportunities to learn it. And I would like to come now to my uh, other research field, to physics, <coughs> to show that there are some topics uh, which really are today or dependent on good instruction. So if you may try to solve this problem, I think we all were faced with similar kinds of problems when we were in, uh, yeah, in uh, high school, when we had uh, yeah, mechanics instruction. But the uh, fact is that uh, this, uh, no matter uh, how long your instruction was, the solution rates are very low because uh, yeah, physics is one of the most difficult uh, fields. And what uh, is uh, normally found that uh, student solution rates for students who had uh, undergone a curriculum on mechanics, so who had the chance to learn about force and motion and uh, Newton's uh, axioms, then nonetheless uh, the solution rates are lower than 15%. We even found it for students who enrolled at our university. The question is, of course, what uh, is going on in these classes? It's very well known that uh, yeah, poor physics teachers focus very much on formulas rather than on qualitative concepts. Uh, they, uh, yeah, therefore, many students fail to distinguish between impulse, uh, force, pressure, speed, velocity, and acceleration. Uh, they learn these terms and they know they learn the formulas, but they don't know how to deal with it. Uh, we know, of course, formulas are important, but they should come at the end. Students first should get a kind of qualitative understanding of these concepts before they uh, yeah, learn to deal with formulas. Teachers very often, particular physics teachers, have a wrong idea of, uh, of how humans learn. They have clearly this direct transmission view. They think they have to write the uh, definitions and the formulas on the blackboard. And if the students are intelligent enough, they just should observe uh, them in their mind. Uh, but of course, this is not the way to do it. And uh, te many teachers, uh, we do a lot of studies on teachers, have little knowledge of how to provide cognitively activated, uh, activated uh, environments. I will now come to my current research, uh, where we try to improve achievement in physics um, and to better exploit the intelligence resources by improving teacher education. The study is run by Sarah Hofer. It's an ongoing study, but we already have enough results to be uh, 
to uh, at least be hopeful that it, uh, <coughs> yeah, we will have really nice findings. What we know, of course, is that many otherwise complex students are spending years in physics classes without acquiring any usable knowledge that may help them to better understand the world. It's also called underachieving in physics. Sarah had been in a Swiss gymnasium in many classes. Uh, she had uh, administered intelligence tests. I come to this later. But she found that there were students with an IQ of 135 who, complete, uh, 35, yeah, who completely failed in physics. In, uh, they had poor grades and also in some uh, tests uh, which focused on conceptual understanding they uh, showed that they didn't have understood uh, the most important things. At the same time, she found a correlation of zero between intelligence and the grades uh, in physics. It's, all, it's a select example, but uh, it's nonetheless interesting. And uh, I wasn't uh, astonished because intelligent students probably don't like uh, road learning of things they haven't understood, so uh, they just uh, gave up physics. and. Um, also was confirmed in the results among these were very um, a lot of females. But what we found was that really, uh, yeah, when we had a teacher training, and it's a quite intensive <coughs> training we do with some teachers, uh, who, um, and the teachers learn to focus on conceptual <coughs> understanding, the number of uh, underachievers was really tremendously reduced. I will leave it with this description because I want to wait for some more quantitative results. But I think we better can exploit intelligence in physics classes as we can currently do. So in the last, in the last part of my uh, presentation, I will stay with the question uh, how yeah, intelligence and school uh, achievement come together. And I will focus on uh, admission. As I said in the beginning of my talk, in the German-speaking countries, we still have this tracking system. There is an academic track in Germany and in Austria. It starts at age 10, in Switzerland a little bit later. As students go to the gymnasium, and if they are successful, they uh, can go to university after nine years. And the, uh, this, uh, the decision for going to the gymnasium is not based on standardized tests, and a standardized test and also not an IQ tests. It's more kind of a school achievement, teachers' recommendation, and so on. Therefore, the question is, uh, if we have IQ data, uh, how do they, are they related to this admission to the gymnasium? And in the different data sets, uh, some of them I already introduced uh, to you, uh, I got data which helped me to find out uh, whether yeah, intelligence uh, kind of prevails or is a surefire for admission to the gymnasium. So here you have the first uh, data set. It was from the Munich Longitudinal Study <coughs> we are already familiar with. When the children were in uh, grade four, uh, we uh, administered an intelligence test. It was a verbal test. The decision was already made by the teacher who <coughs> the recommendation for the gymnasium and who didn't. And what you see is here is the distribution of the children who didn't get the recommendation and the distribution of the children who got the recommendation. And of course, the mean was higher than this one. Uh, all of them would be really crazy. But you also see a very big overlap. There were about 60% uh, yeah, of the students, uh, you couldn't guess from the IQ whether they would go to the gymnasium or to a school which leads to uh, vocational education. Uh, at this time, uh, I thought, of course, uh, there must be, uh, and we know it, there is, of course, a big effect of social background. Uh, parents who have a university degree, they uh, yeah, really uh, persuade the teacher to give their child a good recommendation, while other, others don't. So, uh, particularly, this should happen in the middle. We see an IQ of 110. The probability is similar of going to the gymnasium or of going to the vocational <coughs> track. So, IQ seems not to be too selective when it comes to uh, this uh, school system. I now have data uh, 20 years later. These data were from the 1990s. These are not my data. I asked a colleague. Uh, 
who ran a very big uh, large-scale study on reading achievement and who also administered this little intensive <coughs> test. I wanted to find out whether uh, the social, the, yeah, the impact of social background will only be in the middle of the IQ distribution or whether we will also find it at the upper end. That means uh, will also children have an IQ of higher than 115, will there be the social uh, bias? And uh, <coughs> it was uh, a uh, it was uh, one of the first uh, attempts in Germany to administer just a standardized test. It was on reading. It was run by uh, yeah, my colleague Wilfried Groß, and uh, they uh, yeah, they made the analysis uh, I asked them to do. They also had a questionnaire about the background, so that they could uh, <coughs> find out whether the, uh, the children come from a high, from a middle, or from a low social background. So here you see the results. Uh, I presented them in a very easy way. The social background you see here, and here you see IQ uh, under 100, IQ 100 from 115, IQ out over 115. And uh, yeah, these two uh, yeah, uh, probabilities are particularly interesting. For a child who comes from a high social background, the probability to go to the gymnasium is 0.50, quite high given that the gymnasium should be an elite school. Uh, but for a child with an IQ uh, higher than 115 from a low social class, the probability is also 0.50. So I was a little bit shocked by this data because it really shows that it's not the IQ, but it's really the social background which um, decides uh, where the children go to. And uh, I should say, I, I don't have the data here, but the decision on uh, going to the gymnasium was made on school achievement. And what was also found, there was a test on reading achievement that these kids were that good in reading as were well these kids. But of course, the question is uh, what has gone wrong in school if school isn't able to teach uh, children with, uh, yeah, with an IQ like this uh, reading. That's something really awful wrong in the school system. So uh, some data in Switzerland. In Switzerland, it's a little bit different. In Germany and also in Austria, about half of the kids go to the gymnasium. Uh, I think even more in Austria now. But in Switzerland, they don't want to more than 20% of the students to go to the gymnasium. It's a quite strict uh, line. They have very good uh, yeah, vocational education training, so it's uh, very cool not for all the other kids. Uh, but the question is also, of course, what uh, are these 20%? Are these the most intelligent 20% or uh, not? And I can uh, use the data from Sarah Hofer, who did the study on physics education. Uh, here is a theoretical uh, distribution. If the most intelligent 10% would go to the gymnasium, it's, uh, there should be an IQ, uh, a minimum IQ of 112.6, uh, uh, because it's a percentile of 80. And the distribution should look like this. If uh, yeah, the admission would be by chance, it should look quite like this. Yes. And here I have the real data. And what we see is uh, the norms were a little bit outdated. So you see it's, uh, it, uh, it's more than the maximum. Uh, the curve should be shifted a little bit in this direction. But there are also at least 30% of these students who go to the gymnasium, who get the recommendation to go to the gymnasium, but they miss uh, yeah, by far some of them the minimum IQ. And there are, of course, also the same number of uh, the same part of students who bring the IQ, but they don't get uh, the X, uh, they don't go to the gymnasium for whatever reasons. I don't have data on social background, so I don't know, but uh, I have strong hypothesis that it has to do a lot with social background. So what can we learn from all this data? I now come to the conclusions. <coughs> School education supports the expression of the genes which are related to intelligence. No questions. Uh, I never called into question when I saw all the twins and studies that there are stable IQ differences, but at the same time, IQ needs uh, time and needs support to develop. <coughs> Academic achievement 
results from investing intelligence into knowledge acquisition. And this has to be done in a uh, successful way. A proper investment of intelligence into academic achievement cannot be taken for granted, but rather depends on teachers' competences and on admission policy to higher education. And these are not always in the shape they should be. But what we also saw is that investment in teacher education and in their professional development is worthwhile for more as well as for less intelligent students. They all gain from better instruction, and this is probably the most important message. And I could end now, but I would like to, uh, for one minute, to describe my ongoing study. We think that we really should work on students' knowledge uh, in topics which are difficult to learn, for instance, physics. Therefore, I started a big longitudinal study with my colleagues on early physics education, it's called the MINT study. MINT uh, is uh, mathematics, uh, informatics, natural science, and technology. This is a German abbreviation for STEM. And uh, we train 300 teachers in uh, instructing some topics of physics already to elementary school children. For instance, why does a large ship of iron float in water or how a small piece of iron sinks? And there are other topics which helps children to develop some basic concept of form of buoyancy force and of density, or uh, they give up misconceptions, for instance, that air has a negative weight and all these things. And we hope that this kind of instruction will help all children to become uh, better in physics learning. This, uh, we already uh, were quite successful in implementing <coughs> the instruction in school. Uh, but, uh, of course, we have to wait for the harvest because the children have to grow older. Uh, but a uh, central research topic, and now I come back, is the impact of intelligence on trajectories of conceptual change. I still think there must be uh, yeah, different ways of learning concepts uh, for more or less <coughs> intelligent students. And I have a doctoral student who is focusing on this, and this ends my story. It's Peter Edsbrunner, he was Alyosha's master student, uh, and he joined my group as a PhD student. So I hope I, hope I convinced you that there is mutual benefit of education, <coughs> technology, and intelligence research. stimulating, controversial, uh, that's uh, how it should be. Uh, and the question is, are there any questions or ideas, or do you know of any studies showing an aptitude treatment interaction, for example? <laughs> questions? Yes. Okay. Could you tell us a few more details about the study that found a correlation of zero between IQ and education achievement? That seems uh, uh, astonishing. So it was just between grades in physics at the gymnasium and uh, IQ. Uh, we, uh, we found it because uh, yeah, the students uh, who uh, some students who really didn't understand uh, anything about physics, but they nonetheless got good grades from the teacher because they uh, were quite good in yeah, using formulas or in world road learning. So in, at least it, it's of course a select sample. But we had some data which really showed that uh, yeah, within classrooms uh, there was no correlation between IQ and uh, the grades. So what, what sample size are we, are we talking here? Uh, altogether about 200 or so. Hmm. I hope it's not always the case, but uh, in this uh, sample we found, we found a higher correlation between IQ and achievement tests. You spoke about the relationship <coughs> between uh, intelligence and, and admission to a <coughs> um, gymnasium. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I want to um, add that in Germany, usually not the teachers decide who is going to a, a gymnasium, but the parents. Yeah, that's new. In this sense, it wasn't the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second, uh, intelligence is not a perfect um, predictor for uh, success in school. Mm -hmm. If you add to an intelligence test, for example, the educational level of parents, it could be that you uh, 
improve the predictability of school success, but this would not be um, a criterion of the <coughs> child itself. It would be it would be somewhat unfair, but you can increase uh, the explained variance. And the final comment, and uh, I also suggest that we use central tests, student achievement tests, to make the decision who is going to a gymnasium or not. But I think it's in Germany totally impossible to, to make this, because then many people or parents uh, could not decide that their child will go to a gymnasium, mm -hmm. especially if you have the problem with, uh, uh, with parents with academic background. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree that in the recent years it's the parents' decision yeah. which makes it even worse because the social bias increased after this because uh, yeah, low uh, educated parents do not dare to recommend their child for the gymnasium. But of course you agree we couldn't just add or we couldn't uh, add for the decision the social background of the parents. And if it really increases the achievement uh, outcome, this is a very bad sign for schools because uh, schools uh, should compensate for uh, <coughs> children's background. That's the purpose of schools. So if a child is really intelligent, uh, no matter what background he or she comes from, she should learn proper reading and all these things in schools if we would have uh, good instruction. Last question. Uh, Excellent talk, and I imagine it went down reasonably well in this audience, the idea of holding two concepts in your head, education and intelligence at the same time. It's really good. I, I wonder if you could give us your uh, intuition about why... My, my intuition is that that would go down less well in an education conference. And, and, I, and I, I, don't, I don't understand why. I don't know if you do. Probably in your head... Um, I, Probably you should go to education conferences, for instance, for the European of the European Association for Learning and Instruction. Um, yeah, some of you may be a little bit biased when it comes to educational psychology that uh, they are not interested or they even deny intelligence. I think this has really changed tremendously uh, in the last years and. Uh, in, I published uh, all these papers in the Journal of Education Psychology, of course, which is a yeah, high-ranked journal. They accept individual differences. Uh, probably there are some teacher education institu uh, institutions which uh, do not want to accept it. Therefore, I think it's very important that teacher education takes place at universities uh, so that yeah, research and uh, scientific findings uh, yeah, can be yeah, taken into consideration when, uh, yeah, when it comes to planning the curriculum. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. In an hour we meet at the Landhaus Keller. Please take your name badges. Uh, they are the ticket to uh, having the bank taking part in the bank. <laughs>